Welcome to the MD's Fantasy Football Show. Now for your host, Dan Mater. And welcome back to the show, MD Nation listeners. I am so excited to bring you guys today's episode, Fantasy Analysis by Team Depth Charts Part 3. We're going to be covering the Buffalo Bills, the Jacksonville Jaguars, the Carolina Panthers. And on the last segment of the show, we have very special guest Dave Zangaro, NBC's beat writer for the Philadelphia Eagles, coming on to the show to interview with us. I cannot wait to bring you all of today's content. I know you guys are really going to enjoy the show today, so make sure you listen all the way through and you're, you're definitely going to want to get that interview because we got a lot of great inside information about a team that will be heavily heavily uh, fantasy impacted going into this season for redraft leagues especially so I don't want to waste too much time remember follow me at Twitter MDFF show get all the player update news notifications as we go along with episodes alerts same thing with Facebook at MDFF show there as well and be sure to check out the website MDFF show Dot com for all the latest news going on with the show, with your off-season research from last year's stats, also keeping up with the new episodes that are being published there as well. I don't want to dwell too much on this intro. I want to get right into it because we have a lot of content to cover in today's episode, starting with a latest news segment. I know the last two episodes I said we weren't going to do a latest news segment in this mini-series because we're going to be talking about each of these players uh, thoroughly, and we're going to be going through the news in that way, unless some Something earth shattering happened, unless something important enough happened that we would have to talk about it. And likely, if that happened, it would be negative. And of course, that's exactly what has happened. Melvin Gordon comes out and says he's going to hold out throughout training camp, and if they can't get a contract done, he will demand a trade. Now, within the past couple of days since that first news has broken out, he has said he really wants to get a deal done with the Chargers, Chargers where he wants to be at the end of the day, kind of backing off a little bit of the pay me now or I'm out scenario that he was trying to put out there or maybe his agent was trying to put out there earlier on in the week. Uh, Something to keep your eye on. My take on this as of now is that I lean towards Melvin Gordon most likely getting paid you have Philip Rivers who's aging. You don't know exactly who the quarterback of the future is going to be at this point. Melvin Gordon is going to be a huge key for whoever that's going to be in order to keep that offense humming even after Philip Rivers does retire possibly this season, maybe next season. So Melvin Gordon I do think is in a position right now where he has all the leverage. He's in the last year of his deal. He's performed admirably throughout his career to this point. I do think at the end of the day the Chargers will get a deal done. I think it might be a couple weeks in the training camp, though, so I'm not going to be surprised if Melvin Gordon misses a couple weeks of training camp here. Uh, But I do think he will be playing week one. I do think they're going to get a deal done. That would be my take as of now. We know last year from the Le'Veon Bell situation, anything is possible. Anything can change on a dime. So... You know, make sure you keep that in mind. This is just my take on it right now. I have no other inside information for you as far as, you know, the likelihood or the timing of when a deal could possibly get done between the two parties. The second thing I do have to mention quickly is Chris Hernan. He, or Chris Herndon, sorry. Chris Herndon, he was suspended for four games after getting popped for a DWI. So I had kind of talked a little bit about it in the coaching changes impact that I was not big on him being a tight end who was going to break out. A lot of people have him as a sleeper tight end. I was not one of those people. And now with the DWI, uh, he's definitely somebody who should be completely falling off your draft boards all together at the position. Maybe somebody come back to revisit as a waiver claim at some point throughout the season, but he should be falling off of your draft boards altogether now with this latest news of him having to miss the first four games going into this year. That's our latest news segment. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to take a quick break. We're going to get right into the podcast with the Buffalo Bills on the other side. Tired of spending hours upon hours on research for your drafts but still want the excitement of having something on the line while watching the game? Well, join the Thrive Fantasy app where they have streamlined the process for you to make it easy and fun to play along. Use promo code MDFF when you sign up with a $10 deposit and receive an additional $10 for free. Again, that's promo code MDFF. 
The Buffalo Bills are probably one of the most anemic fantasy football rosters out there heading into this season. There's only a handful of guys, not even a handful of guys. There's like maybe two guys on this entire roster that even really have fantasy potential when you're looking at it. And one of those is the quarterback in Josh Allen. Look, he had one hell of a run towards the end of the season. His rushing ability gives him a pretty decent floor on a week in, week out type of basis. Uh, I've been on record before, and I will, I will go over here again, of course, because we're, t- we're talking about the Bills and Josh Allen uh, specifically here, and that is I'm not a fan of his passing ability. Yes, he can throw it a mile, but he can't hit the broad side of a barn when it matters uh, on a consistent basis, So, and I don't think that's going to something that's going to change this season. He had a long way to go. The fundamentals are simply not there. I don't think he's going to take the leap that he would need to take from last year into this year in order to be a consistent quarterback. He was always around 50% completion percentage as a collegiate quarterback, so this is nothing new when it comes to Josh Allen, and he's never really shown signs of improvement when it comes to his accuracy. I'm not expecting to see it this season. What you can know about Josh Allen is that, like I said, you're going to have a decent floor because you know he is going to run when he has the opportunity to do so. Every once in a while, he's going to put up decent passing stats because he, because of his arm, because of the speed that they have at wide receiver, he is going to get a couple of big chunk pass plays here and there to make him relevant in that part of the game as well. But this is an offense that is just not going to score a lot of points at the end of the day. It does not have a lot of firepower. I It is really limited as far as how much this offense can score and therefore limits the fantasy potential. To me, I would not be drafting Josh Allen, but he would be on my streaming radar. Uh, maybe you can make the case if you're, if you're going to stream quarterbacks anyway, you want to wait till the 16th round, 15th round, whatever the last round in your drafts happen to be, and you want to take a guy like a Josh Allen, a Lamar Jackson. That would make sense to me in those situations because you're going in with the mindset that you're going to stream anyway. So take a guy that you know that runs, start you off with a decent floor, and then see how the season goes and how it flows. But with Josh Allen at the end of the day, it's just he's so inconsistent in the passing game. And if you play in a league – that counts against you for interceptions, then he really becomes a hindrance because there's a very likely scenario, just like last year, that he's going to wind up throwing more interceptions this season than touchdowns. There's a very real chance that's going to wind up being the case. So that's something you kind of have to keep in mind when it comes to Josh Allen as well. I know a lot of people wanted to hype him up. I know a lot of people you know, had big success with him when they picked him up in the playoff run last year because it happened at the most critical part of the fantasy season. That's why a lot of people still remember it going into this season. But just keep a reasonable expectation as to what Josh Allen really is and as to what this Buffalo offense can actually be this season. That's something you got to keep in mind. Backing him up is Matt Barkley. Uh, If something were to happen to Josh Allen, Matt Barkley has no fantasy value whatsoever in case you were actually wondering about that. Although at this point, I don't think anybody would be. Uh, For the running back situation, this is where everything just, you know, everything just hits the fan because You have LaShawn McCoy, who's still there, and as of now, still expected to be the starter. But you sign Frank Gore, who just refuses to leave the NFL. You bring in TJ Yeldon, who is a pretty young guy and has been pretty solid in the opportunities he's been able to have when he was in Jacksonville. Not great, but solid at a little bit of everything. Solid catching the ball, solid enough at running. He's a good, solid back. That's what he is. And then you draft Devin Singletary. So let me lead off with this, because a lot of people want to talk up Devin Singletary uh, for the Buffalo Bills at some point this season. Possibly because this is a team that's going to be in a situation that they're not going to make the playoffs. There's a very real chance that they're just going to be playing for next year, maybe by week eight, week nine. And maybe in that scenario, Devin Singletary could emerge as the starting running back. But I do not believe it would be until later on halfway through the NFL season but in the later third third three quarters three fourths of the fantasy season and at that point I don't know how much fantasy value you really think Devin Singletary is going to have he shouldn't be somebody you're drafting hoping that you could stash him and play him later he's somebody you should be picking up off the waiver wire if he does happen to have value later on in the season 
I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Now, that could all change if the Buffalo Bills decide to cut LeSean McCoy. But at this point, it really feels like unless they trade him, LeSean McCoy is going to be on the roster. And because his season is last year and the Bills, frankly, have no reason to save him, I almost think this is a situation where they might just throw LeSean McCoy to the Wolves and say, screw it, we're not going to go to the playoffs. I don't need to save you. Go ahead, we're going to get the last juice out of you as we possibly can. And then maybe later on in the season, when the season's officially lost, Devin Singletary will come in and take over. So LaShawn McCoy is somebody I, I don't know how to touch. I don't I actually, honestly, right now, I don't know how to feel about LaShawn McCoy. Right now, his ADP has him going about the 10th round. He's a starting NFL running back, and he's proven to be able to play at a high level in the past. And even last year, when they were finally able to get Josh Allen going, he did have a couple of decent games towards the end of the season. And it's one of the one of the worst offensive lines on top of it. And he was able to still show you something. So the 10th round, it could be an RB4. Uh, he does have some value there. He's technically starting running back in the NFL, so he should have value. But because they have Frank Gore, because they have TJ Yeldon, because this is going to be a bad offense with a bad offensive line... I'm just not touching this situation. I'm not. Because if any, if there's going to be value out of the Buffalo Bills running back situation, it's not going to be till later on in the season, and it's not going to be until Devin Singletary is the one taking over. Up until that point, it's going to be LaShawn McCoy, Frank Gore is going to get touches, TJ Yeldon's definitely going to get touches. I don't think there's any value to be had there. There's no reason to touch the Buffalo Bills running back core. Let someone else make that mistake. Let someone else have that headache. There's just no reason. There's no upside with it. Yeah, okay, LaShawn McCoy is an RB4. You're never going to play him. There's never going to be a game in which you're going to be like, yeah, let me play you. Unless you are devastated by injury or are on crazy bye weeks and have no other options if you draft him. That's the only scenario in which you're going to play him. And even then, you're probably not going to feel that good about it. And there's a pretty good chance you'll probably be able to find something better on the waiver wire. So I'm just not I'm not touching the Buffalo Bills backfield until halfway through the season when I'm picking up Devin Singletary off of waivers. Not drafting, but picking him up off of waivers. And that's something we're going to have to keep our eye on throughout training camp as to what's going on. I still think LaShawn McCoy maybe does get traded, but as of now, that is how it stands. For the wide receiver core, uh, it's kind of the same thing as running back core. I'm not touching it. For what? For who? For John Brown to, what, have a similar season to what he had last year when Lamar Jackson took over, which is maybe once every five games he catches a bomb, it's nothing you're going to hold your hat on. You're not going to feel any confidence in playing him. He's not even somebody who I would bother taking in best ball leagues because I think it's going to be so few and far between when he's actually fantasy relevant given the situation of the offense. All I keep hearing all summer long so far is that Cole Beasley is the safety blanket for Josh Allen. Cole Beasley should lead the targets for the Buffalo Bills. Who cares? From a fantasy football perspective, first of all, Cole Beasley is never going to be a guy who can possibly get you more than five touchdowns, and that's his max. That's number one. Number two, even if he does lead the Bills in targets, it's still a good chance it's going to be less than 80, 90 targets anyway. There's no value to be had here at the receiving core. None whatsoever. It's going to be strictly lightning in a bottle if you have a Buffalo Bills wide receiver who gets you a good fantasy week and you actually played him in your lineup. I still think Zay Jones is their best red zone target. And right now he's number three on the depth chart. It's John Brown, it's Cole Beasley, and then Zay Jones. I think Zay Jones is honestly the best receiver for Josh Allen because he has a good wingspan. He has good hands. Josh Allen just needs to throw it in his area. Guys like John Brown, guys like Cole Beasley, Josh Allen's going to have to be somewhat accurate to be able to get into those smaller guys, something he cannot do on a consistent basis. I still think Zay Jones is probably the best fit for him. Really, the best fit for him would be having a bigger targeted wide receiver, but because they don't have that, Zay Jones at six feet tall, flat, is going to probably be the best that they have to offer. At the tight end position, they try to bring in Tyler Croft. He got hurt. You have Dawson Knox, the rookie. That's great. He might be decent. He might be a decent talent. Maybe somebody in a dynasty league you want to stash, but I'm not paying any attention to him whatsoever in a redraft league. There's nothing to be had. Now, the Buffalo Bills' biggest fantasy asset might be their defense. Defense played really well last year. There's no doubt about it. However, I do extremely, extremely believe that they overachieved a season ago. Kyle Williams is gone now. We'll see if they're able to fill that void. 
But I have a hard time believing with how bad that offense is that defense is going to be able to hold up being on the field for most of the game week in and week out, which is what is going to happen when the Bills are not able to control the ball by running all the time. And because that offensive line is so bad, I don't expect them to be able to do it against most teams. So the Bills are definitely a defense that should be on your fantasy radar. And I have no problem if you want to draft them because there's a good chance they are still wind up being a top 12 defense. So there's still a good chance they'll be a defense one for you, especially if you're in a 12-team league. But I'm not expecting top five potential, especially the way they've been drafting right now because in a lot of leagues, the Buffalo Bills are second or third top defense off the board right now in a lot of different leagues, in a lot of different formats. Don't take them that high. Don't don't take them that high. There's plenty of defenses out there that I think are getting overlooked right now, a la Denver Broncos, uh, just to name one off the top of my head. And we'll get th- we'll get into that more when I have my projections and my rankings, and we're going over each position and who are the sleepers, who are who are guys to avoid, and we'll get into that more in August. But I'm I'm not touching it. I'm not. Steven Hoshka is still the kicker of the Buffalo Bills. They are going to be in field goal type games. I do think there actually is some streamability to him. Now, nobody you're drafting, but when they play teams like the Jets twice, when they play other teams that have bad offenses that are just going to be like a field goal fest, I do think he could be worth could could be worth a streamability if you need a kicker for that one particular week. That's going to wrap up the Buffalo Bills. On the after the break here, we're going to talk about the Jacksonville Jaguars. The MD's Fantasy Football Show is now partnered with the Unwrapped Sports Network. Unwrapped Sports Network has a top-notch sports blog covering all sports all the time with a team of talented writers. You can also visit their podcast page to listen to this show and several others covering multiple sports. Sign up for their newsletter and never miss a thing at UnwrappedSports.com. Again, that's UnwrappedSports.com. The Jacksonville Jaguars are not going to be that far off of my Buffalo Bills analysis, quite frankly. There's only one player on this entire team that I'm even thinking about in a fantasy perspective, and that's Leonard Fournette, for obvious reasons. And I'm actually going to lead it off with Leonard Fournette rather than leading off the quarterback in this one, because that's how much he is the only relevant player on that team to even be thinking about. Look, everyone was talking about Leonard Fournette gets hurt and he gets injured. Yes, that's true. So far throughout his very, very short early career, he has been injury prone. That is true. I also think he's due to have a more healthier season. He's back down to the weight that he was in college when he was running around in his prime. He's in better shape this year than he has been for the past couple of seasons. So all of that plays well to his benefit, I think, in preparation. The other thing that plays well to his benefit is that he's going to be the featured guy when he's out there. There is no more TJ Yeldon to take away pass down work from him. It's going to be him. The backup running back is Alfred Blue. Alfred Blue's not coming in there to give him any kind of committee. He's not coming in there to steal third down passing work from him. Behind him is Raquel Armstead and Benny Cunningham. We know what Benny Cunningham is at this point. He's a backup. He's a special teams guy. That is all he is. Armstead's a rookie. We'll see what he has, but he wasn't taken particularly high. He's not somebody who's expected to to challenge Leonard Fournette for any kind of workload share. So this is Leonard Fournette's backfield, and it says it all in the depth chart. They are going to have him out there. He's going. The plan is that he's going to get the ball twenty times on the ground, and now apparently he could have be in line for like four to five targets each game because that's how much he's going to be utilized. He is going to be the Jacksonville Jaguar offense. And there's a couple of things. So can he stay healthy? Also, can that offensive line stay healthy? They got banged up last year. They weren't that great to begin with, but this is an offensive line where if they can stay healthy, I do think they are a competent NFL line, enough so for a talented guy like Leonard Fournette to be able to take advantage, especially being fed the rock the way he's going to be fed in that offense. This is still going to be a run first team. It does not matter that they hired John DeFlippio as the offensive coordinator, as I talked about in the coaching changes, fantasy impact. Nick Foles is not going to be throwing the ball 35 to 40 times a game in this offense. This is still Doug Marone's offense, which means it's still going to be a run first offense. And now Leonard Fournette has nobody, nobody challenging him for work share. None whatsoever. Alfred Blue is only going to come in there to give Leonard Fournette a breather from time to time. All of the work is going to be there. 
right now, Leonard Fournette is a guy who's going between the third and the fourth round in ADP across all platforms right now. He is a guy that if he just play, all he has to do is play 12 to 13 games, and he will finish the year as an RB1 with the amount of work that he has in front of him and with the talent that he possesses, especially now that he's going to be catching the ball as well. It helps him a lot in PPR formats, the fact that he will be able to get work in the passing game. So now he's not a liability in that factor either. I'm telling you, if he just plays 12 to 13 games, 12 to 13 games, he will be an RB1 this season. He's one of my biggest values that's going in the late third, early fourth round right now in fantasy drafts. Now, yes, it's early. We'll see what happens in training camp. You're not going to see him playing any preseason games, but things things will change on the rankings and such. But as of now, he is one of the biggest values that you could possibly have in that third, fourth round because he is a guy who should be able to get you RB1 type potential because of his talent and because of the work of the workload he's going to have. He's going to be one of the few featured backs that's going to be out there. Nick Foles, please, I mean, I don't think anybody's drafting Nick Foles right now. His ADP has him not being drafted in most leagues, unless you're ridiculously deep, like a 16-team league, maybe then, two-quarterback league, maybe then. But don't do it. Nick Foles is not even going to be a streaming option at any point this season. I don't love the receiving options. D.D. Westbrook is the only guy to me that has a chance to be able to do anything, and even that's going to be widely inconsistent due to the fact that he's still probably going to predominantly have to play the slot. They're still going to want to keep him away from the perimeter, and it's still going to be largely big play predicated in order for him to be able to do something fantasy-wise on any kind of consistent basis. And I don't know when there's going to be a scenario in which you are going to sit there and be like, yeah, this is the week that I want to play D.D. Westbrook and ever feel good about it if you find yourself in that situation. So I'm not touching any of the pass catchers at Jacksonville. None of them. No, there's no reason. It's another Other than I don't think Nick Foles is very good to begin with, and I think he'll prove as such, that's another reason why I'm not touching Nick Foles. Marquise Lee, maybe he's back. Maybe he's not. It kind of sounds like they're having some trouble gauging on where Marquise Lee is right now. They definitely thought they were going to have him back at this point. That is not a guarantee right now. Not a guarantee at all that he's back for week one. D.D. Westbrook's your best receiver. You bring in Chris Conley. Okay. We know what Chris Conley is. He's, he's a role player. Keelan Cole, at all the hype of Keelan Cole last year, where was he after week one? Nowhere. As I kept trying to tell you guys, let someone else make that mistake last year for Keelan Cole. Yeah, he's not even on, he's not even being snuffed on the fantasy radars right now. There's nothing on here. Nothing on this team. Geoff Swam, starting tight end, don't care. Don't care. There's nothing on this team that has any value. The talent is not there. It is all Leonard Fournette, and that's all you're really going to care about. Now, the defense, the defense is a little bit of a different, different story, and Leonard Fournette goes a long way. If Leonard Fournette can stay healthy and they're able to run the ball the way they want to be able to run the ball and keep their defense at least fresh enough, I expect that defense to make a huge, a huge step forward after last season. They vastly, I don't know if I've ever seen a defense underachieved the way the Jacksonville Jaguars defense underachieved last season. A lot of it had to do is by the time of the end of the year, the offense was so pathetic that the defense was just like, the second we give up any points whatsoever, we know we lost. And you can't really play that way as a defense. Letter for not being healthy will go a long way with that. Being able to control the ball, being able to have a competent offense, that'll go a long way. And I think the Jacksonville Jaguars defense will get back to where they were to, maybe not quite to the level they were two years ago because they were they were like a borderline RB1 with the way they were scoring fantasy points two years ago. But somewhere in between where they were two years ago and where they were last year, I think is definitely somewhere in between there is where the Jacksonville Jaguars defense is going to be. I do think there's a very good chance they are going to be a top three fantasy defense for you to be able to choose from. Josh Lambeau is the kicker, in case you were wondering. Again, I don't think the offense is going to be competent enough for me to want to take Josh Lambeau or even stream Josh Lambeau on any kind of consistent basis. Similar to the Buffalo Bills, there might be some matchups with the Tennessee Titans and a couple ones here where they might have the opportunity to get themselves into a field goal grudge match. And maybe in those situations, if you're looking for a streamer, a kicker, maybe Lambeau might have some value there. But that is the only scenario in which that could possibly happen. So that wraps up Jacksonville Jaguars. There's not a lot to talk about there. We do have a little more to talk about, though, when we talk about the Carolina Panthers after this break. The MD's Fantasy Football Show is proud to become the newest member of the Belly Up Sports Network. 
The Belly Up Sports Network is a rising star in the sports industry. After having emerged onto the scene in just a year, they have accrued a massive following with bold articles, standout podcasts, and great debate amongst followers in the forums. Sign up for their newsletter and get access to all of the information throughout the Belly Up Sports Network. Go to bellyupsports.com today to join. Be bold and stand out. Cam and shoulder, shoulder and cam. How is Cam's shoulder? Where will it take him? Where can it be? How is it? These are all questions that are just constantly being circulated around the Carolina Panthers, especially when you're trying to examine them from a fantasy perspective because a lot of their fantasy potential as a roster really kind of depends on it. A lot of people like Curtis Samuel and DJ Moore as sleeper wide receivers this season or as possible even breakout candidates. And none of that can happen if Cam's shoulder is not good to go coming off of its second surgery. Look, personally... I've been watching some videos on Cam when he was throwing the ball in minicamp. He's ha- he's been working on this new throwing motion, quote unquote. And let me tell you something, that new throwing motion that he has been working on looks a hell of a lot like Peyton Manning's throwing motion that he had left his very last year in the NFL when he had no arm. None whatsoever. But the thing about Peyton Manning was that he had anticipation and also could read the hell out of a defense. Cam has really never developed either one of those skill sets. He doesn't throw the ball with great anticipation. He's still not a great reader of the defense. He's still not incredibly accurate. So if he doesn't have the zip, if he's lost even more arm strength than he did last year, which from watching him on videos that I've seen thus far, it kind of shows me that he has or at least it's definitely not there yet, possibly building up strength over rehabbing and getting into training camp. That is a possibility. But from the last time we were able to publicly see Cam, I'm telling you right now, his arm's not even as up to snuff as it was a season ago, and that's a scary thought because he had to become captain check down last year. He was basically a bigger, more athletic Mitchell Trubisky. That's essentially what he was a season ago because he had to become captain check down because he could not throw the ball deep with consistency unless he was already on the run to give him that extra momentum to get some air under the ball. It was scary. And I have seen nothing to make me feel like I know he's definitely going to get better. And if, not only have I not seen anything that makes me feel like I know he's going to get better, but I would make the argument that is a good, there's a more likely chance that it's going to get worse. Then it's going to get worse. He's he's an older quarterback now. He's turning thirty. He's trying to throw up his. He's trying to change up his throwing motion. Are you kidding? After a second shoulder surgery, to take to take the to take the what to take the beating off the shoulder, to take the wear and tear off the shoulder. Listen, if he cannot get a full throwing motion going in the season, there is nothing. There's no zip going to be on that ball. None whatsoever. I would not. I would not touch Curtis Samuel or DJ Moore in redraft leagues. I would not draft either one of these guys. I have to see what Cam Newton is before I'm going to put myself out there and actually take one of these guys in positions where there's a lot of sleeper wide receivers this year. I like Dante Moncrief. I like Devin Funches. Both guys plan to be promising in the red zone. I take both of those guys over Curtis Samuel or DJ Moore. I take Devontae Parker and his possible upside potential going into this season with no Adam Gase over a DJ Moore and Curtis Samuel. I mean, you name it. A lot of the receivers that are in that territory, I think, have a hell of a lot more upside. And DJ Moore, DJ Moore, his ADP is like in the seventh round. That's ridiculous. He doesn't belong anywhere near that group of receivers. You're talking the Will Fuller, the Robbie Andersons, the Alshon Jeffries, the Mike Williams. You're talking about that group of receivers. He doesn't belong anywhere near that tier, especially without knowing exactly what the status of Cam Newton is at this point. Look, Cam himself as a fantasy, he's always going to have value because he's going to run. You know that when you get in the red zone, he's as likely to run the ball in as Christian McCaffrey will be. So who's going to have value in that sense? He's going to be a borderline QB12. Borderline. He's still 80, His ADP is still a little bit higher than what he should be going at too, but it's in, it's in the vicinity. It's in the range because of his rushing ability. It'll be there. You're playing in a division where you get to play the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense twice. 
Falcons and the Saints, I expect both of their defenses to be a lot better, so I don't think there's going to be great matchups for them. But play Tampa Bay's defense twice. Look at the rest of their schedule. There's going to be some games where he'll be able to put up, you know, 250 yards, maybe two passing touchdowns, and then you guys see what he gives you rushing. But to me, I think Cam's the type of guy that you're taking really late. I, I think there's a very good chance that he winds up being a quarterback who's going to be available on the waiver wire on a lot of platforms for you, and that you'll be able to wind up picking him up that way. And maybe Cam's going to probably wind up becoming a streaming quarterback at some point this season. There's too many question marks. There's too much risk involved. There's not there's not enough to make you feel like, yes, I can feel good about Cam. I can feel good about the receivers. Same thing goes for Greg Olson. Look, Greg Olson, whatever you think about him and his foot injury, as long as he's on the field, he is going to be Cam's go-to target, especially in the red zone. That's just how it's going to work. But even then, I don't expect this offense to be a high-scoring offense. In fact, I expect this offense to be kind of bad this year. That offensive line did not improve in any capacity whatsoever. And like I said, with the question marks with Cam and how that's going to all work, I don't know how many points this offense in general puts up. So Greg Olson, someone else that you could take late based on name. Maybe you'll have some value. I mean, at that point, when you're talking about Greg Olson, his ADP being in 13th, 14th round, most of the tight ends going in that range are really hit or miss anyway. So if you want to take the chance, like, oh, you know what, maybe when they get in the red zone, he'll be the number one guy. That's about as good of a reason to take a lot of tight ends in that range anyway. So I'm not going to knock you for that. But he is somebody who I think more times than not will probably not be getting drafted. And that's probably the right thing. Christian McCaffrey. Of course you're going to take Christian McCaffrey. Christian McCaffrey is the only one who's fantasy foolproof on this offense right now. You know he's going to get the ball. You know he's really good. You know he's going to catch it a whole bunch. Even if Cam's arm sucks, he can still dump it off to Christian McCaffrey. If Cam's arm is good, then even better. That means guys are going to get out of the box and have to respect the deeper ball, have to respect the speed of Curtis Samuel and of DJ Moore. And that's just going to help Christian McCaffrey have more room to operate in the middle. The only thing I will say about Christian McCaffrey is that Greg Olson does have a hand-in-hand effect with Christian McCaffrey as far as the passing game goes. We saw it last year before Greg Olson got hurt. McCaffrey was not targeted that often or as often as people have gotten used to him being targeted in each game when Greg Olson was playing. In fact, a lot of people who took Christian McCaffrey were kind of struggling the beginning of the season because Greg Olson was eating up that shorter over the middle area of the passing attack. So, that's going to also depend on what his injury is like. How how sharp is he? Does he look good? The reports that I've been hearing thus far is that Greg Olson has looked explosive. He has looked good off that foot. It hasn't been bothering him. He has been able to explode out of his routes. So if that remains to be true, then Greg Olson should be a factor. But that's something we're going to have to see. I mean, he's an older tight end. Guy has screws in his foot. It's usually not a good situation at the end of the day when you get into the wear and tear over the 16-game NFL season. So I'm not counting on Greg. Even if he's maybe good in September, I'm not counting on that to continue throughout the entire year. Which is why I said Christian McCaffrey is probably as foolproof fantasy-wise as it comes. Because the one thing nice about him is that even though the offense itself, I don't expect to have a big year. I don't expect him to be able to put up a lot of points. He makes himself safe because he's going to catch the ball so often. Because he's going to run the ball. He's always going to have a very high floor because he's going to be involved in the game. No defense is going to completely take take Christian McCaffrey out of the game altogether because of the how many ways he is involved, how important he is to that offense, how many times they have to get him touches in order for that offense to be able to even be competent. I'm telling you right now, a lot of people are going to tell you I'm crazy. That's fine. Cam Newton, at best, is a top 12 quarterback this year. I think he's more likely going to be a 15-16 range and more of a streaming guy. I think he's somebody who, in your league, if somebody drafts him, you're going to be able to have the opportunity to pick him up off the waiver wire come week five, week six. Because that, I'm telling you right now, that arm is not going to get stronger after his second surgery. It's not healthier. It's not. They are so focused on making sure he doesn't wear and tear himself too much that he's not going to be able to function the way Cam needs to be able to function. That's what they're doing right now. So just take it from me. That's my two cents. Like I said, I'm I'm leaving it that way. I'm leaving it open-ended that way because I know a lot of people are going to disagree. And you even listening might disagree. But just know you heard it here first. Just keep in mind 
that shoulder is going to be an issue and you're going to be fully taking Cam Newton just for running. You could take Josh Allen, you could take Lamar Jackson for that same reason. And yet Cam is going on average about four rounds earlier than both those guys. There's no reason for it. And as a result, I'm staying away from the receiving options. Christian McCaffrey at the end of the day is the only guy I'm taking. Another thing I want to point out real quickly with the Carolina defense, a lot of people seem to be hyping them up. They seem to be popping them up in the top 10 of fantasy defenses. They have a decent front four. Yeah, they'll have a decent pass rush. Yeah, they lost Thomas Davis. You have Luke Keekly, which is good, but he's been banged up the last couple of years off and on, and their secondary still blows. So I don't, I don't know what they did in the secondary. All of a sudden, people were like, oh, yeah, they're going to be really good defense again, like old Carolina defense. Like I don't, I don't see it. I don't know how, and you're playing in a division where six times out of the year you're going to be playing top 10 offenses in the NFL. So I don't see where Carolina becomes this top 10 fantasy defense whatsoever. So just keep your mind on that as well. Graham Gano, he's always a decent kicker. He's always hovering around the top 10 of kickers. He'll be there again. He has a leg. You know, He always kind of makes up for it. Even if Carolina doesn't score a bunch of points, they usually do they usually are a pretty heavy field goal kicking team, and because Gano can boot those 50 yarders for you and make them pretty consistently, he usually hovers around that top 10 area. And I don't expect that to change or necessarily dip, even if the offense itself dips in production a little bit, because he should still have his opportunities to be able to make up for you with those longer kicks. All right, now that we've wrapped up the Carolina Panthers, we're going to take one quick break, and then we're going to get into what is an awesome interview with Dave Zangaro from NBC, the Philadelphia beat writer, on the other side of this. Stay tuned. I can't wait for you guys to listen. The MD's Fantasy Football Show is proud to become a new member of Overtime Heroics. Overtime Heroics is a fantastic sports media platform for sports fans all around the world to come and participate in their extensive forums. And now with the merger of the Land Sports Network, the website will soon have great content available from extremely well-written articles to entertaining and informative podcasts from all sports for you to enjoy. All you have to do is register for free at OvertimeHeroics.com to participate. Again, that's OvertimeHeroics.com. And welcome back to the show, MD Nation listeners. And I have on the line for you a very special guest to help us break down the last segment of the podcast. He is the NBC beat writer for the Philadelphia Eagles and co-host of the Eagle Eye podcast. You can find him at DZangaro, NBCS. Please welcome to the podcast, Dave Zangaro. Hey, man. How are you? I'm I'm great, man. It's really great to hear from you. I'm so happy you came onto the podcast. You know, we're going through here. We're talking, you know, fantasy analysis by team depth charts. Philadelphia Eagles are a huge are a team that has a, a huge amount of fantasy potential, as you well know, is that offense should be rock solid this year. So I'm definitely very happy to have you on to help us break it down. Yeah, I mean, they might have too many guys for it to be a great fantasy team. Honestly, it's it's uh, it's kind of tough to figure out. Where the ball is going to go? No, I, I can't disagree. Before before we get into all that, though, um, I do want my listeners who maybe have never read your stuff before or listened to your podcast, which both are phenomenal, by the way. Right. Um, but how how did you become how did you become a writer for NBC covering the Eagles? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I've been working for NBC in some capacity now for about a decade, which is kind of crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, we know each other from way back in the day. I was trying to think about it. Um, yeah, that was more than a decade ago. Yeah, that ago. was a long time ago. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I did a bunch of high school stuff for a long time, and I, I interned with then uh, Comcast Sportsnet back in uh, 2009, I guess. Um, they hired me shortly after that as a part-time gig. Worked part-time for them and for the Burlington County Times for like two years. Then I moved to Houston uh, full time to cover the Texans. Uh, worked there for about two years before that network shut down, and then came back to Philly without much of a plan. Uh, worked at the uh, Byland Daily Journal and the Courier Post for about six months until uh, NBC Sports Philadelphia, or no, we're still CSN, um, called me up and uh, offered me a job covering the Eagles. So that was about four years ago now so I'm, I'm going on uh my, i started in the 2015 season so um yeah it's kind of crazy i've been back 
this long already, but it's been good. Oh, that that's great! And you came back uh, just in time, right? When the Eagles are back, you know, going to the playoffs every year again, and a perfect perfect time for you to come back. Yeah, right? and I got to enjoy the end of the Chip Kelly era, which was a lot of fun, honestly. <laughs> Especially for writing about it, I'm yeah, sure. It was great. Uh, uh, what I mean, so on that note, what's been your best experience since working for NBC Philly? Well, I mean, I'd be lying. I'd be trying too hard if I said anything other than the Super Bowl. Um, and right. in the moment, you know, covering that week, it's it's a lot. It's uh, you're not sleeping much. You're, you're kind of working all day, all night. On top of it, I don't know if everyone remembers this, but a lot of players got sick that week. I. I Probably That's go right. around twenty to twenty five percent of the players. Uh, I got that too, so I was really sick <laughs> toward the end of uh, end of that Super Bowl week. Even Super Bowl Sunday, I was um, had a, a bunch of cold medicine going through me, so uh, <laughs> that part wasn't fun. But you look back and you're like, I, I covered um, such a historic game and such a, a crazy historic week. Uh, that was cool. It was it was a cool feeling, and uh, being around the players that week was interesting because you know throughout the entire season they kind of act like you're bothering them and um there's certain walls that are up when you get to the super bowl week uh they're getting bothered by you know 100 national reporters and they look at you and they're like oh i know this guy um right I've, familiar I've been, face I've been talking to this guy for three years now so uh it, in a weird way you know you're obviously separated from the team and uh, journalistic integrity and all that, you're not rooting for them, but uh, you feel a certain like kinship with those guys because you have been there uh, throughout the whole season. You've kind of witnessed all the ups and downs of it. So it was, it was a unique feeling. It was something that, uh, you know, I always thought it would be cool to cover a Super Bowl, but I didn't really uh, understand all the things that would go into it. Oh yeah, I mean, I I can't I can't imagine being in that position, um, especially being sick that week as well. Did you actually get to enjoy the game? No, no, no way. I mean, the game was a blur. It was, um, <laughs> and you know that game was it was incredible. But you know when I'm writing on not writing on deadline, but I have a buzzer story to file. Um, so you know, and it was a game that was back and forth. It came down to the wire, obviously. So it wasn't like if it was a blowout, I would have taken more of it in. But um, we were so furiously trying to catch up and look up things and write. Um, I remember there was a moment after the game was over where I'm, I'm just hammering away at my keyboard trying to finish up my story. And I look up and all the confetti has started to spray. And I thought to myself, well, I should probably get a photo of this. I should probably stop writing for a second and get a photo and a video. And I did. And I still remember that because it was, you know, you're so tunnel vision on, on what your job is that uh, it's hard to kind of appreciate the moment. But um, later on that night, I was able to, and I didn't sleep that night. The next morning, we're talking to Super Bowl MVP Nick Foles. So the whole thing was really kind of surreal. Wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's incredible. And that, that is an interesting take from it. You know, you are there to work. So it's, it's hard for you to really be able to enjoy that moment. Uh, even 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 though it's an incredible moment to be a part of, so that's that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, I have a good really story get that perspective for you. Actually, so this is uh, after the game. You know, they they bring some players to the podium, then they let reporters in the locker room. But the players don't really have any time to themselves in the locker room after the Super Bowl. It's kind of unique because there's all the on-field celebrations. So basically, when players get in the locker room, it's open for reporters, which is. That never happens normally. Normally, they get some time by themselves. Uh, so we get in there, and as I walk in, they started to play Dreams and Nightmares, which was obviously their anthem for the season. So it was kind of cool to be a part of that and witness that. And then, uh, I, you know, the trophies getting passed around the Lombardi. And uh, at one point, Corey Clement and Garrett Blunt are taking a photo with it. I take a photo of them for them. Um, and then Corey Clemens holding the trophy and he's looking for something to pass it to. And he looks at me and I was like, no man, there's no way I can be seen holding the Lombardi trophy in the, <laughs> in the Super Bowl locker room. But it was just kind of funny that, uh, I, I could have been in that position if I wanted to be. Wow. I, yeah. That is a story that only you can have. Yeah, that, that's, that is great. 
That is awesome. Well, let's actually jump in and talk about the Eagles heading into 2019. Uh, you know, keep it in mind, we're doing it for fantasy perspectives. You as an insider, you you have all the information uh, that we're looking for. And the number one thing that people are going to talk about when it comes to the Eagles and comes to fantasy value is what is the feel for Carson Wentz, you know, his back heading into the 2019 season? He's healthy. He looks good. Um, I, I really – I think the back is – kind of a non-issue at this point i think the bigger thing and it's not an issue but it's an important note is him a year another year removed from the acl um we kind of lost the acl in the in the back injury but um i think there were he didn't obviously look like the same player from the 2017 season and i'm going to attribute a lot of that to the knee it's it's not that he was not healed from the knee injury but um it's really a two-year injury. It really takes a long time for a quarterback, really any player, to get the strength back, the explosion back in that knee. And uh, even Carson's admitted to me that um, he didn't feel quite like himself. And I think another year removed from that uh, pretty serious injury because it it wasn't just the ACL, it was the LCL too. And uh, that's a point that kind of gets glossed over by too many folks. Um, But a year removed from that, um, I think that's going to help. I, I think he's he's going to be back to the level he was in 2017. He has a good offensive line in front of him. He has plenty of weapons around him. He just got paid. There, there really aren't any excuses for him to not be an MVP candidate this year. That's what they're expecting from him. And uh, honestly, I'd be a little surprised if he isn't very, very good this year. I mean, I completely agree with you as somebody who's been analyzing fantasy numbers and getting projections and rankings out, uh, especially as a recent before we get into August, before the draft season starts here. And that is, I fully expect Carson Wentz to have a boom season. That I think the addition of Deshaun Jackson, which we'll get into in a little bit, is going to be huge for that for him and that offense in general. Just adding that dimension to it. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more that I think Carson Wentz really should have a great year. And I always thought he was definitely a franchise caliber quarterback. I never thought there should be any debate when it came to that issue either. Yeah, and and I think a big part of it too is the offensive line. They they did get nicked up last year, but even if Brandon Brooks, the right guard, isn't ready to play week one, I, I think they'll still be okay. Jason Peters at 37, we kind of know the deal there. If he can be on the field, he'll help them. But if not, now they have a first-round pick ready to back him up instead of Big V, who struggled uh, quite a bit last year. Um, Jason Kelsey, he didn't retire. He's back at center. He's the best center in football. Um, Steph Wisniewski decided to come back and be a backup which was a pretty huge get for them to um, yeah, really. bring him back as a backup at a, at a really discounted rate. Um, and Big V's playing guard now. I think that'll help extend his career, and it gives them more depth. Jordan Mailata is another year into his progression. So the offensive line's a big part of this. They have potential to be um, one of, if not the best, line in football. And uh, with that and with the weapons, Carson Wentz has everything. Uh, kind of laid out for him. I I agree. So one of the situations with the Eagles that is kind of hairier would be the backfield situation. So what what are your impressions thus far? Who do you expect to start? What kind of rotation do you think there will be? Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a tough one, um, and it, it's going to be one that could probably have some fantasy owners like pulling the hair out. Uh, because I think Jordan Howard is going to be the guy at the beginning of the season. Um He's the veteran. He he kind of deserves uh, the the nod to be the starter at the beginning of the season, and, and he's probably going to be the guy on the goal line too. Um, he's shown the ability to run through, between the tackles. Um, Corey Clement is still around. I I think his role, at least initially, is probably going to be a lot of third downs. Um, but Miles Sanders is too good to keep off the field. Uh, he's a second round pick, really talented player who I think eventually is going to become a feature back, uh, meaning that you know Doug Peterson has used a running back by committee since he's been here, but I, I don't necessarily think that is what he wants to do. I, I think he's at times has even shown that he wants there to be one lead guy. He tried to make it Josh Adams last year. So I think eventually um, Miles Sanders is going to be that guy. The question is, does it happen this year? And if it happens this year, when? 
Um, Miles Sanders needs to prove himself a little bit. He missed all of OTAs with a hamstring injury, so he's first got to get on the field in training camp. Um, I'll have a better sense for once we actually see him on the field with the rest of the team. But right. if he can prove that we know we can run, we know we can run to, between the tackles, he has to prove three things. He has to prove, one, that he can hold on to the football. He fumbled a little bit too much in college. Two, he has to show that he can be a receiver out of the backfield. Didn't do a ton of it in college. Uh, seems to have the ability. And three, and most importantly for him, if he wants to get on the field on third downs, he has to pass protect. Uh, he's a willing blocker, not a great blocker, not even a good blocker at this point, uh, but he's willing. And uh, as long as you have a willing running back, they can teach you. Deuce will teach him that. And uh, eventually I, I think he's going to start stealing snaps from Jordan Howard and Corey Clement. It's really up to him how quickly that happens. Yeah, I yeah, I definitely see what you're saying with that. It does seem like they took Miles Sanders with the idea that he would be the featured guy down the line. Uh, to your point with Doug Peterson, you know, he goes back to the Andy Reid history where if they have the option to not use running back on committee, they they will lean that way if they don't have to. I, so I, I do agree with that point. My I guess my only thing is that I agree with you. Jordan Howard should get the nod. And also because the offensive line is so good and because I think the offense in general will be so productive – I do think there's a chance maybe it's not till next season just because I do think Jordan Howard is in a position to be able to play really well throughout the year with this team. Yeah, we'll see how he does. I mean, it, the number drop like the, the yards per carry drop off is a little alarming over the last over his uh the first 3 years of his career. So, Agreed. um I don't know exactly what they're getting in Jordan Howard. I'm not sure they do either. Uh it'll be interesting to see with Miles Sanders. And the other part of it is Look, when you draft a running back, the, the clock starts ticking. You have four years of this guy under contract. Running backs don't last forever. Um, and this team, they they did pay Shady at one point, but they've been real hesitant to pay running backs big money. Uh, so you might only have Miles Sanders for four years. Um, are you really willing to waste a year of that time? Probably not, right? Like You're going to want to yeah, maximize... One of these years, and you can, I guess you could say the same thing with Jordan Howard, but um, you, you never know with a running back how long the shelf life is. Uh, and we've seen so many rookie running backs have success early that it's not like it's not like he's a, an offensive lineman that might need time to learn. It, it's not that kind of position. You can play on day one, so I think in some ways he will. I, I think it will be a committee. And eventually, I think he's going to earn more and more playing time. All right. I like it. Well, so the, back to Deshaun Jackson and Carson Wentz. The early reports that I had been hearing was that there seemed to be immediate chemistry between the two. Is that consistent with your view? Yeah. Uh, and I, I was actually surprised. I, look, it, it's not real football yet. So the timing isn't exactly right when guys aren't banging in front of you, when the pads aren't banging in front of you. But, um, the deep ball was there, and that's kind of surprising because Carson's never played with someone this fast. He's never played with a guy. He was the fastest that's guy true. he's played with, Torrey Smith, um, Mike Wallace yeah. for two games. Actually, no, he didn't even play with Mike Wallace because uh, he, he didn't play the first two games Nick last Foles. year. Um, Bryce Treggs? I mean, the, <laughs> the history of deep ball guys, he hasn't had it. Uh, Deshaun is not just the best deep ball catcher in the league he's probably one of the best of all time if not the best of all time so this is a new animal for Carson and uh, I was surprised to see how quickly those two mesh at OTAs they seem to get along real well and um, all good so far I mean that can obviously change if uh, if the Sean doesn't hit the ball thrown his way as much as he'd like but uh, right now yeah those two seem to be on the same page and it's a good sign that's that's awesome. Well, keeping with with the wide receivers, how has Alshon Jeffrey looked so far as far as a, a health perspective? He looks okay. Um, he, he's the kind of guy who always looks really good in practice. He's just a kind of a physical specimen. Um, yeah, he is coming back from the the broken ribs last year, but he should be okay. Uh, he should be ready to go. The problem for any fantasy owner, this is probably the. I don't think probably th- this is probably pretty clearly the best receiving core in Eagles history. Um, at least with 
really the top four if you include our Sega Whiteside, who's a really promising young rookie. Uh, but certainly the top three. I, I don't know if there's any receiving group that, that comes close to this, honestly. Um, you have three really good receivers, and I know they, they paid a lot of money to keep Nelson Aguilar, and you can debate the merits of that, but he's still a pretty good player, and he won't have Golden Tate hogging any snaps in the slot this year. It's all his job. Um, I don't know how much our Sega Whiteside is going to play, but he certainly looks good early, too. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think Whiteside is going to be great for the future. And if you're in a dynasty league, Whiteside would definitely be a pick uh, that you would probably want to be able to take. I personally am a huge Alshon Jeffrey fan for redraft leagues this season. I think right now is for his ADP is kind of somewhere in the sixth, seventh round. And this is a guy who, if he's healthy, having Deshaun on the other side of him to take that safety away from him a little bit, he he's great at the one-on-one matchups. He's great in the red zone. He's great at, ju- at going for jump balls. And I think if he has has that, that one less defender paying attention to him, which is what Deshaun will demand. I really think Alshon could have a huge year this year, uh, keeping in line with Carson having a huge year as well. He could. Um, it, it's funny, though. I One of these guys is going to lead the team in receiving, and, and I'm not exactly who, sure who it's going to be. Um, That's a hot take. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, it, look, it, it could be Zach Ertz, too. Yeah, um, that's true. If Zach Ertz caught 116 balls last year, He's not going to catch 116 this year. He shouldn't. Um, but there are so many players that you have to figure out. And, and really, they have to figure out what what personnel packages they're going to use because um, you can't keep everyone in the field at the same time either with Dallas Goddard in the mix. So they have to decide um, how often they're going to be in 11 personnel and how often they're going to be in 12 personnel, uh, either with three receivers or two. And I think a lot of that's going to be matchup based, which is another kind of nightmare for fantasy owners because you got to kind of look at the defense they're playing and figure out, oh well, Dallas Goddard might be on the field more this game because they they have a, a really good slot receiver or a really good uh, nickel corner they want to kind of take away, and it's going to be a lot of that type of kind of stuff with Doug Peterson this year. It's going to be a lot of week to week matchups, figuring out not just who gets the ball but who's on the field. Well, leading into that, that's going to be my next question: Is what kind of what kind of role do you think Dallas Goddard's really going to have at the end of the year? It's tough. I, it's, you know, he's too good to keep off the field, and it, it's kind of the praise and the expectations are so high for him. They're so high that you know Nelson Aguilar is making nine point four million dollars this year, and he's going to take snaps from him. There's just no way around it. He needs to. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if, if 12 personnel is going to be their base package. I kind of think it's going to be about a 50-50 split, uh, which is a lot. It's, it's a whole yeah. lot. Um, last year they were second in the league in 12 personnel and, and you know frequency used behind the Texans. I kind of expect them to be first in the league this year. They're going to use two tight end sets a lot, and they should. Dallas Cotter is a really talented player, and I think he's just kind of scratched the surface on – what he can be. Well, that that's huge for our listeners because when you're when you're in a fantasy league that that still plays with tight ends, I know some of them are doing away with it, but for the most part, most leagues still play with a tight end. To have a team that could possibly hold two tight ends for legitimate fantasy value, Dallas Goddard is somebody who could be a sleeper for people because, like to your point, if he if it's going to be a fifty fifty split, he's going to have his own fantasy value for guys to be able to take as a sleeper. So that's a very important note for our listeners to to know. Yeah, and, you know, like I said, Zach Ertz isn't going to catch 116 balls. And Dallas Goddard caught 33 last year. I I wouldn't be surprised to see him catch 50 this year. Honestly, I, I think that's realistic. Okay, wow. Uh, one last question for you. And that would be the defensive side. Most, you know, most fantasy leagues still play have a defense. I think this Eagles could be a, a sneaky sleeper defense this year. I like the pass rush you guys have. Uh, do you think they've addressed some issues in the secondary? Yeah, I think they've addressed them in a roundabout way. It's not like they added great players, but um, they have a lot more depth now, and they have a lot of young players. You know, all those guys last year who got thrust into action now have all this experience and I don't know who's going to end up being the starters at cornerback but um, I think they're going to be in a much better position this year than they were last year just because 
um, if one guy doesn't work, they have another guy to replace him. And uh, they're all young. They're all talented. They just have to put it together. Uh, I like their secondary. Rodney McLeod coming back should be big if he can stay healthy. Um, we know Malcolm Jenkins is going to play at a high level. The interesting thing about this defense is on the line because they're not as strong on the edges anymore. I mean, they lost Chris Long. They lost Michael Bennett. Uh, but interior, they're deadly right now. Fletcher Cox next to Malik Jackson and then Tim Jernigan coming off the bench now. I mean, that's that, that can that's be a really – great. I mean, they're going to get a lot of pressure up the gut. When you get pressure up the gut, um, it comes faster and it forces quarterbacks to throw – off their back foot, it forces interceptions, it forces fumbles. Uh, so I think they're going to be able to generate turnovers uh, with their interior pass rush, and that's a big deal. Oh, well, yeah, I totally agree. I think that's going to be a very active and penetrating defensive line that you guys are going to have there uh, this this season. I would, yeah, that, that's going to, like you said, it's going to cause turnovers, it's going to be sacks, um, and I can really help out, you know, a secondary that is young and developing as well. That's, that's one of the reasons why I do think they are a defense that maybe in most leagues aren't going to get drafted, but somebody who's going to be a great pickup streaming for you during the season. Yeah, especially if they play Eli twice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's always a help, too. Yeah. Um, so that's going to wrap it up for this interview. I, you know, let our, let our fans know what's, what's something that you're working on now, coming up, best places to, uh, to find you, and anything else at all that you would, you would like to talk about. Yeah, man. I mean, we, uh, the, my, my podcast has been a lot of fun, the Eagle Eye podcast. Uh, we're kind of ramping up now, heading into, uh, into training camp. We're getting there soon, so you can follow all that stuff. He, you can figure it out. <laughs> My Twitter handle is yeah. Zengar NBCS, uh, and I'm, most people I'm sure are familiar, but if not, uh, NBC Sports Philadelphia dot com is where you can read all my stuff. Yeah, and uh, you're, you've always been a great writer ever ever since I've known you, going way back when. And uh, I was before before this interview, I was listening to quite a few of your guys' episodes, and uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed them. So definitely a great listen, definitely a great read. So everybody here should really go check out uh, Dave Zingaro at D Zingaro NBCS. That's going to close it down for this interview. Dave, thank you so much for coming on. I had a great time with you today, and I hope you come back again sometime. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right, that is going to close down today's episode. I hope you guys all enjoyed it. I think we got a lot of great content out to th- out to you with a great interview there at the end. Make sure you are following along at MDFF Show on Twitter for all the player update news notifications along with new episode alerts. Follow me at Facebook at MDFF Show. Make sure you check out the website MDFFshow.com and also check out our networks that we are a part of. You can find us there and a lot of other great content as well with the OvertimeHeroics.com, UnwrapSportsNetwork.com and BellyUpSports.com as well. Make sure you check us out on your favorite podcast app, Radio Public, Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, you name it. The MD Fantasy Football Show is widely available to you. I will be back again on Thursday with another episode and another guest that I cannot wait to introduce you all to as well. So I will see you guys on Thursday. Take care. Thank you for listening to the MD's Fantasy Football Show.